I'm Filippo Crea, editor in chief of the European Heart Journal. Well, a warm welcome to all of you to the open editorial board meeting. We have an editorial board meeting every year during the uh, annual Congress of the European Society of Cardiology. And because of COVID this year, the editorial board meeting uh, will be virtual. And of course, there are disadvantages with a virtual meeting. We do not have the pleasure of meeting each other. We cannot meet eyes. We cannot shake hands. But the virtual meeting also gives an opportunity because we can expand the number of invitations. And today we have the largest uh, editorial board meeting ever. It's an open editorial board meeting, open to all players of the European Art Journal, not only editors, but also authors, reviewers, and, uh, uh, and uh, all together, to uh, enjoy the successful story of the European Heart Journal. Please remember that you can join the meeting via Zoom or via YouTube. And this meeting will be posted in uh, YouTube. And this is the agenda for today. I will present the new editorial board, which is not so new any longer because the editorial board has been there for the last year. I will give you a journal update. I will then ask uh, Professor Ryusher to present the top papers of 2018, 2019. And there is an important reason for this and I will tell you about. I will present the new initiatives of, uh, at EHJ. And then we also have the opportunity of discussion and questions. And please, you can, you can ask questions starting from now uh, via chat. Uh, when you have a question, please, you can send it via chat, Zoom or YouTube, and we will receive these questions. And this would be an occasion for me to address your, your questions. And then uh, last but not least, the awards. But let's start with the uh, presentation of the editorial board. And you see, this is the largest editorial board of the European Art Journal ever. We have different types of, the, of editors with different roles, complementary different roles. We have executive editors who work with me on a day-by-day -day basis. We have, of course, a senior editor who is Tom Lusher. And then we have co-editors, a global co-editor, Jim Brangwald, and uh, co-editors from all continents, two from North America, uh, one from South America, two from Europe, three from Asia, one from Middle East, two from Africa, and one from Australia. And the co-editors are the ambassadors of the journal in the different continents. They create a link with local important events, local important meetings. I will come back to this because this is an interesting new feature of the European Art Journal. And then we have the deputy and associate editors. We have 21 mini team. Each mini team is composed or is made of a deputy and two associate editors. And uh, these mini teams cover the 21 areas of cardiovascular medicine. And each mini team handles, manages the uh, all papers in, uh, in its field of expertise. And you can see here these 20 field of expertise. We have mini teams in acute cardiovascular care, arrhythmias, cardiac and vascular surgery, cardio-oncology, clinical trials, congenital heart disease, diabetes and metabolic disorders, digital health and innovation, these epidemias, epidemiology and prevention, genetics, healthcare and economics, heart failure and cardiomyopathies, hypertension, imaging, interventional cardiology, ischemic heart disease, thrombosis and antithrombotic treatment, valvular heart disease, vascular biology and medicine, 
and also we have joint editors with cardiovascular research to make the interaction between the two journals as active as possible. So you can see that these 20 mini teams cover all fields of cardiovascular medicine. And again, each mini team handles papers in its specific area of interest. But we also have uh, section editors. We have editors for cardiovascular flashlights, for the weekly journal scan, which is a new initiative of the journal. I will come back to this. Uh, discussion forum, image bank, quality standards, statistics, social media. We have a large panel of local associate editors. We have also a podcast editor and, of course, an illustrator. So you can see it's a large and complex editorial board. And the success of the journal is based on a perfect integration within this large editorial board. And this integration, which is working very well, is made, uh, well, just a second, uh, one more important feature, CardioPulse editors. We have two new uh, editors of CardioPulse, Luca Riberale and Francesco Panini. And I was saying the success of the journal is based on the uh, on a perfect integration of this complex and large editorial board. This integration is working very well. And I'm grateful to the editors for uh, participating with enthusiasm to the life of the journal. But this integration is made possible uh, thanks to the work of our uh, wonderful editorial office, which is based part in Zurich and part in Rome, led by Amelia Mayer. And I'm sure you know, many of you know her very well. You see, this lady's smile, but they are iron lady, they are very tough. And, and if I make a mistake within minutes, they tell me, well, here you have made a mistake. But uh, the organization of the, the editorial office is really excellent and allows the organization of this complex editorial board. But not just the European Art Journal. The European Art Journal is the flagship. Uh, but we have this large journal family, is the largest journal family in the world in the field of cardiovascular medicine. And the integration, we have a, a total of uh, 14 uh, journals in addition to the European Art Journal, uh, in particular, two new journals, Digital Health and the Open Journal. And again, the integration, the teamwork aim on this journal is working very well with a continuous uh, transfer of papers among the different journals. Uh, coming to the journal family, let me thank the members of the Publication Ethics Committee, which is, uh, is one uh, committee for all journal family. And I wish to thank Martin Simons, Kim Fox, Christian Hamm, Matt Damon, and Ursula Ravens for their contribution as members uh, of the uh, Publications Ethics Committee. And now, now let's come to a journal uh, update. Uh, and uh, you will see it's quite interesting. Submissions. Uh, this year, partly due to COVID, we experienced an increase in 2020, a 64% increase in the number of submissions. And also in 2021, the number of submissions is much larger than in previous years. The acceptance rate is about 10% for clinical research articles. We have an international global distribution of submissions. And in 2021, the top submitting country uh, so far is China, followed by USA. And this is, of course, a very important uh, slide. Uh, is the slide showing the impact factor for the five uh, for the top five journals in 2020? And you can see that uh, this year the European Art Journal the journal enjoys a high uh, impact factor of 29.9 is second after nature review or after nature reviews uh, but nature reviews doesn't publish original uh, papers 
And then the European Art Journal is uh, uh, followed by, by circulation, by junk and by uh, circulation research. Please note that all journals are enjoying uh, some increase of DIF. And this is in part caused by change in methodology in 2020 impact factor calculation. And this is leading to, to has led to this inflation uh, in, the, in the impact factor. But please note that we have made careful calculation and 54% of the impact factor increase for the European Art Journal is due to higher overall impact, not the change in methodology. So it's a, a true remarkable increase, which has brought our AF close to 30. But uh, this positive experience is not limited to the, to the European Art Journal, but also to all the other journals of the, uh, of the journal family. All journals in the family have experienced uh, some increase of the IF in 2020. And these are the top cited papers published since 2020. Uh, as usual, guidelines, the IF of guidelines is very high. And then we have two original papers and one review article uh, with the highest uh, IF, uh, with the highest, uh, cita uh, highest number of citations. And you can see that all three papers deal with COVID. It's not, uh, it's not surprising that highly cited topic in this COVID, in this COVID era uh, are related to the COVID pandemic. But please note that this increase of the IF uh, is also uh, paralleled by an increase of downloading. Uh, as you know, the IF uh, is an index of the impact of the journal and is particularly important for the editors. The uh, uh, downloading of papers is more an index of the interest of the audience, of the readers in the journal. And you can see that the increase in the impact factor is paralleled by a remarkable increase in the number of downloadings, which means that influence and impact in our case are going together. The red, the red dot is the month of the SC Congress. You, you see there's a sharp increase in the number of the downloadings uh, during the SC Congress. The usage in 2020 was 20% higher than in 2019. Uh, the readership is truly global. Uh, the top downloading country in 2021 so far is the US, 20% uh, of all downloads. And top original articles downloaded in 2021 so far, the, 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 the article uh, mostly, mostly downloaded is again, is again a paper on, on COVID, not uh, surprisingly. And the impact of cost, of course, is, is boosted by, by the, the social media. At the beginning of 2020, Tom Lusher created this uh, Twitter channel. Uh, well, uh, after a bit more than one year, uh, we, we have observed an exponential increase in the number of followers. And the current number of followers is more than 7,000. Is not a large number, but again, we started less than two years ago. And we have a very, very active uh, uh, group of social media editors who uh, work on this, on this channel. And another way to, uh, to boost the, the influence of the journal, uh, of course, uh, is, ex is expressed by the Altimetric score. And many papers published in the last year really are characterized by extremely, exceptionally high altimetric scores. And another way to increase the impact of press release. This year, we had nine uh, OUP managed, uh, Oxford University Press managed press release in 21 so far, plus additional press, press releases issued by the uh, ESC. And please note that papers featured in press release tend to generate very high altimetric score, 
like, like this paper we published uh, recently, the leap arousal, the leap, sorry, the leap arousal, uh, the leap arousal burden is associated with long-term cause and cardiovascular mortality in a large population. The message here is very clear. We have to sleep well uh, to enjoy an healthy life. And now we come to Tom Lusher, to my, uh, to my predecessor. Uh, why uh, I'm involved in Tom? Well, for the simple reason that, that this exceptionally high IF enjoyed by the journal in 2020 is based in, uh, on papers published in 2018 and 2019. Papers uh, handled by Tom when he was editor in chief. So Tom, Please, uh, I, I'm here uh, with me the mostly cited papers which contributed to this brilliant IF. And I'd like to discuss uh, these three top papers. Well, thank you very much, uh, Filippo. It's a real pleasure. I'm delighted to be here. You can see I'm uh, much more relaxed than uh, in the last 11 years. I even allowed myself not to wear a tie. So, uh, uh, but uh, I'm pleased that the, the journal is in good hands uh, now, and uh, I'm uh, delighted to, to discuss uh, three top papers. And the first one is uh, by my good friend, uh, Tom Munzel. I have to be careful that he doesn't get too, uh, uh, you know, excited about his success, but it's actually uh, quite impressive. And uh, you will see uh, two things. Uh, Filippo already uh, alluded to the fact that we have an impact factor and we have this altmetric score. And these are completely two different things, as we will see in the next paper. Now, obviously, uh, Tom is running on the uh, uh, you know, the central stage media topic, uh, namely cardiovascular disease burden from ambient air pollution in Europe, reassessed using novel hazard ratio functions. And he uh, obviously got a lot of visibility uh, because everybody's interested in that. Everybody has something to say about it. <clears throat> and of course, we had a press release. And you can see it's almost uh, an old magic score, all, almost 3,000. I got emails from Tom Munzel whenever he crossed the 1,000 and the 2,000. <laughs> and uh, when uh, it reached 2,800, he even called me. So, uh, and uh, I understand that he was very proud because it's the best uh, uh, health metric score that we ever had, as far as I can remember. It's a very important topic and congratulations, Thomas, uh, to this achievement. You really occupy this topic and we're happy that you publish it in the European Heart Journal. Next slide. Uh, uh, yes. Tom, perhaps we can have a comment, comment on yes, uh, Tom, Tom. Yes, uh, why don't you... It's nice to have two Thomas together. So yes. Let's take advantage of that. Thomas, yes, of your course. Comment, please, from your side. <laughs> So I'm, I'm very proud on that, I must, I must admit, but um, the, the important point is that cardiologists are working together with atmospheric chemists, and this is a, a new direction, and uh, I must admit I was very impressed to see how much damage air pollution can cause with respect to cardiovascular disease, and um, like Leos Lellefeld, the co-author, the main author, is saying, um, it's, it's like a pandemic. So we have two pandemics. We have the air pollution pandemic and also the COVID pandemic. Everybody's talking about COVID. Nobody's talking about or not so many, so much about uh, air pollution. That's our wish actually that this cardiovascular risk factor is getting more attention. And I was very disappointed to see that the AHA guidelines for prevention not even mention air pollution. It's a little bit better in the European uh, guidelines for prevention. I hope that this year when the new prevention guidelines are getting published, uh, it's important that this point is getting strongly addressed. It kills more people than smoking. So, so what do we need more information to say, to make a statement? It's an important risk factor. Thanks, so Tom, for your support. Well, Thomas, I, I think it, it, it is actually very important for the ESC as a topic because this is really very political as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the rise of Green parties, uh, the ESC could really show that they care about this uh, huge global problem. They address it and they address it with numbers, not with, uh, with emotions. 
Correct, correct. Yeah, perhaps, uh, Thomas, we need a viewpoint on, uh, on air pollution versus COVID to consider in the future. And now let's come back to uh, Tom Lusher with the uh, following paper. Yes. Which is, which is, on the, which is here. Yes, this one uh, by uh, Marco Mollimilli, but there is also Tom, uh, Thorsten Lavater, uh, Pascal Ranks, all kinds of uh, big names in uh, acute coronary syndromes and uh, coronary artery disease. It's on the safety and efficacy outcomes of double versus triple antithrombotic therapy in patients with atrial fibrillation following PCI. And it's a systemic uh, review meta-analysis. And this is a real dilemma for us as clinicians. So this is something that's really of big interest to clinicians, less so to the media and the public at large. And it basically shows that uh, there, there is no free lunch. If we use uh, DAT uh, or double antithrombotic therapy versus TAT, triple antithrombotic therapy, we get less bleeding, but we get more stent thrombosis. We get also a trend towards more uh, myocardial infarctions. So it is a dilemma that probably will uh, be with us for quite some years. What's also interesting is this uh, was 60 times cited, but the altmetric score, uh, altmetric score is quite low here. And that shows that altmetric just measures something else. It measures the public interest, the interest of media, of social media, of uh, uh, newspapers and the like. And it can be very interesting for physicians, but not necessarily uh, for, uh, 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 for the media and the public at large. And the last paper, uh, yeah, we don't have uh, um, Marco Valimili uh, in the audience by any no, chance. Well, uh, Marco is not with us, I've not seen him, but I see Greg, Greg Lee. Uh, perhaps you can make a comment on this. On this yes, topic. Greg. Yeah, that would be highly appreciated. Can you, can you unmute, Greg? Please, Greg. A short um, comment on this paper. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, yes, this is a very important paper, and uh, I think this is uh, quite rightly deserves the attention, uh, particularly in the cardiology community. And I share Tom's comments that uh, this may not necessarily take a lot of interest from the uh, general public, but still, I think this is uh, important, and in fact, was. Um, uh, relevant to uh, our clinical practice, managing these AF patients uh, who require who present with an acute coronary syndrome or have a PCI, uh, where it's a balance between uh, thromboembolism and the potential for harm with bleeding. And the third most cited paper in 2018, 2019, is what you see on the screen. Tom, please. Yes, uh, this is again uh, uh, a topic that is interesting for anybody. Uh, particularly for Americans, how many steaks and lobsters should I eat? And uh, Stan Hazen, with whom I have worked on the microbiome for quite some years, has submitted this uh, uh, study, which is a small study in healthy volunteers that were allowed to eat white meat, like chicken and so on, or red meat, the real American steaks. And they measured trimethylamine oxide, which, as you know, is a product of bacteria uh, that uh, see any carnitine or any other product, the phospholipolecithin, uh, derived from meat, uh, but also from eggs and, and lobster and so forth, and has been shown to be prothrombotic and in animal models also promotes the growth of plaques. And so in this uh, study, impact on chronic dietary red meat, white meat, and non-meat protein on the TMAO and renal excretion in healthy men and women, they show that actually TMAO goes up when you eat red meat. And if you switch to white meat, it goes down again. So this is really a very nice uh, mechanistic study. Uh, it was uh, uh, cited 56 times in that period. And you can see again, uh, there is a strong altmetric score, not as good as, as Tom, Thomas's one, but still quite uh, remarkable because anybody's interested in diet, be, uh, not even, you don't have to be a physician, you can be anybody at, uh, in, around the world. They all wonder, what do I have to eat uh, to live longer? And so even lately, one of the front officers at the border to the UK 
uh, when he was he's checking my COVID test, he asked me, oh, you're a doctor. What do I have to eat to live longer? He asked. And here's the paper. Uh, you should avoid red meat uh, because white meat uh, is better for you. So really interesting and uh, interesting for the public at large. Uh, well, in this case, Tom, we don't need an expert because you are the expert. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, we are going to publish an interesting viewpoint. Uh, you are the other on, on wine and chocolate. Do you want to make a short comment also on wine, chocolate and coffee? Of course, coffee for me is very important. Yes, I know that. I, I, I had a, a nasty editor that was insisting uh, that uh, coffee <laughs> better than I was writing uh, about. In fact, you know, I was getting very interested about uh, alcohol because initially I thought every evening when I had a good glass of wine, I would do something good for me. And then I read two papers that really scared me. One was where they looked in uh, British uh, citizens what happens to your cognitive function and uh, there was a, a linear relationship in declining cognitive function with any every glass of alcohol per day i immediately reduced my consumption to uh, one or two glasses at very most and then of course there were also papers that uh, challenged the interheart study that showed some benefit of uh, of alcohol uh, consumption in a moderate uh, way so it's really very controversial whether it's uh, protective at all and this we published in the european heart journal from the sweetheart registry a very nice paper that there is a, a clear linear relation between any glass of alcohol and the occurrence of atrial fibrillation so alcohol be careful with it uh, and uh, so uh, it isn't, uh, of course, nice to drink, but you shouldn't overdo it at all. Then chocolate, of course, uh, I uh, have a conflict of interest because this is a national product. Chocolate clearly is, is very good for you, particularly if it's dark. And uh, Franz Messerly showed in a seminal paper in the New England, there was a clear linear relation between chocolate consumption in a given country and Nobel Prize winners. And guess who was the best country? It was Switzerland. And lastly, coffee. Uh, after some intervention uh, from the Italian side, I have to admit uh, that coffee uh, is not bad for you. It may actually be good for you. And what we uh, showed in some uh, nice papers that we at the time published in circulation with uh, um, uh, uh, Roberto Corti, uh, also from the Southern culture, uh, who drank a lot of espressos. He showed that if you drink four or five espressos a day is better for you than if you're a virgin drinker and uh, uh, consume a coffee once in a while, you have much more sympathetic activation. But if you drink it regularly, as the Italians do and as I do as well, then you're down-regulated and you only uh, enjoy the benefits of it. So Tom, we have spotted that I was the nasty editor pushing for coffee. Was not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. Thank you, Tom, for your uh, really uh, excellent contribution today and for the, your great contribution in the past as editor in chief for ten years. Really a successful story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Filippo. It was a pleasure to participate. But please don't go away. No, no, no. We have a few, few things to discuss. Uh, and now let's come back to the present with the new initiatives at the European Art Journal. Well, the first initiative is the weekly journal scan. And we have a, a, a panel of editors who are in charge of the weekly journal scan. And what is the, what, what is the journal scan? Well, it's a window we have opened on the important papers published in general medicine journals of cardiovascular interest. New England, JAMA, Lancet, BMJ, and also others. So every, every week we publish what we feel is the most exciting paper published in this major general medicine journal, journal during, uh, this, during each week. And uh, the, the paper is, uh, is uh, summarized in key points. And then uh, the journal scan is accompanied by uh, a very interesting uh, comment, uh, editorial comment, written by the editors of the weekly journal scan, which puts the, the paper in, in perspective. 
Another uh, very successful initiative has been the Brown Works Corner, where uh, every five, six weeks, uh, Jim Brown Works publishes uh, uh, an editorial which typically spans from the past to the future on topics he believes are of interest for the, for the readership. And, and you can see here, this was a very interesting editorial, Transceptor Left Heart Catheterization, Birth, Death, and Resurrection. And you can see here the first pressure tracing from the first patient undergoing transeptal left atrial puncture. I'm really grateful to Professor Brangle for this uh, fantastic contribution to the European Heart Journal. And then another initiative which has been uh, quite successful uh, uh, has been the dialogues. The dialogues are monthly webinars. These are Socratic conversations among editors, uh, authors, uh, uh, readers, and reviewers. And they are, uh, again, recorded every, every week and they are posted in, uh, in uh, uh, YouTube. The first dialogue was again with uh, uh, Professor Brownwald on the 400 years of cardiology. We celebrate the birthday after 400 years of cardiology. And the last was with Silvia Priori. Uh, an interesting title, Precision Medicine in the Prevention of Sudden Cardiac Death, Past, Present, and Future. And then another initiative uh, of the European Art Journal has been the creation of, uh, uh, well, uh, an editor position for quality standard in the European Art Journal. And the, uh, the editor is Fernando Alfonso, and a few months ago he published this uh, uh, um, interesting position paper on European Art Journal quality standards. And this is another successful initiative of the European Art Journal. We want to, uh, we try to have a global presence, and this is possible with the help of the uh, co editors. As I told you uh, initially, they are, the, uh, they are the ambassadors of the journal in the five continents. And uh, uh, we managed to have joint sessions, as you can see in this map, we managed to have joint session with the European Heart Journal in uh, uh, the five continents. This has been made possible with the uh, help, uh, the support of the co-editors. And I also uh, want to thank Susanna Dedeke in the, in the editorial office, she is, she is in charge of this complex organization. And well, in the, in the past 12 months, we have arranged the joint symposia with the European Art Journal in 25 uh, Congress in the five continents. And we expect to have 26 symposia already confirmed in the next 12 months. Now it's time for uh, questions. Uh, questions and answer, but I don't see any question from from the audience. I'm I'm con I am checking my my uh, messages. Nothing coming from Zoom. Nothing coming from YouTube. And as I said, as I said at the beginning, uh, we do not have the pleasure of meeting each other, and also the question times becomes more uh, difficult because we are not. Uh, we are not uh, together. Uh, uh, let's hope next year we will have also the 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 the, the visa v uh, meeting. But in the meantime, I don't see questions. I don't know whether Tom uh, has questions or suggestions for the European Air Journal. Tom, any further comments from your side? Well, uh, I think it's uh, going well. I mean, uh, you made. Uh, some really interesting new initiatives. And I think that's important that we always have new features to raise and to maintain the interest of our, our readers. Of course, uh, you know, there will be stormy waters and uh, we had an ASC board meeting that you also attended, Filippo, today. And we will have uh, more pressure towards open access publishing. And we will have to see how to, how to handle this and how to uh, maintain uh, 
the, the financial structure uh, healthy of our journals, not just the European Art Journal, but all the uh, uh, family of uh, ESC journals in general. And uh, so this is one comment. And the second is, of course, uh, you mentioned that uh, you know, now also uh, we have four, 15 journals and some of them had the first impact factor, like quality of care uh, started right away with uh, more than four. So we're really proud that uh, this concept of a family on manuscript uh, uh, transfer has, has paid out uh, for our any new uh, uh, feature and any new uh, journal we uh, start. So uh, these, are, these are my two comments that I wanted to uh, Place. Thank you. Tom and uh, his work in progress, and of course, all these uh, topics needs to be carefully uh, assessed in the future. Uh, other, uh, I don't see questions uh, uh, again. Uh, nothing in my chat, and nothing in uh, in YouTube. Uh, so, Filippo, we have some questions uh, in the chat. One is from Ali asking ah, okay. what your favorite moment has been as editor-in-chief thus far. So, uh, we have this question from Ali. Uh, I hope you don't mind me asking a question. Uh, what has been your favorite moment as editor-in-chief so far? Well, uh, Ali... Uh, She's our, uh, uh, she's our uh, interaction with uh, OUP, with Oxford University Press. And uh, she's asking what has been my favorite moment. Well, my favorite moment uh, uh, has been the uh, organization of this very large and complex editorial board. Uh, is, uh, uh, is the largest editorial board ever for the European Art Journal, but probably also for other, for other journals. And the organization of this, uh, of this complex editorial board uh, has been quite complex, quite demanding, but also extremely rewarding because this complex organization is paying off. It is a nice thing work. And it is a nice thing work not only within the editorial board, but also with the European Society of Cardiology, with the other journals of the journal family, and with our publisher, Oxford University Press. Uh, the, uh, this, this organization has been complex, but has been very, very rewarding. And then I see uh, another question. Thank you, Amelia, for, uh, as I told you before, when I make a mistake, this is noted within seconds. Uh, I'd missed these messages before. And we have another question from Satin Error. How many late breaking trials will be published simultaneously in the European Art Journal this year? Uh, Amelia, if you will remember, there are 12, right? Yes. Um, so, so around 12 uh, simultaneous publications. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then, in addition, we will have the, the, the guidelines. So, it will be 12 plus four guidelines. And then, uh, uh, well, I, here I read Yusuf, Yusuf's, probably Salim Yusuf or another Yusuf, I don't know. Uh, how are we going to promote globalization? Or probably, probably Salim Yusuf, Yusuf, judging from the question. Uh, how are we going to promote globalization the journal, of the journal in terms of topics, relevance, and impact? Well, uh, Salim, this is what we have discussed before. I think that the... Uh, setting up these large panels of co-editors of these ambassadors in the five continents is one way. Uh, we have a very, a very international global readership and, uh, the, uh, and, and we are really working on that. Uh, the, our mission is to really have a global, a global influence. So we are working on this globalization in different directions. Then a question from Ron uh, Waxman, and I see the, the number of questions is increasing. Uh, Ron Waxman, uh, what is your position regards open access? Well, this is what Tom said before, is a different business model, uh, which needs to be carefully organized uh, and, uh, and the cooperation between journal society and publisher is important in this regard. 
Uh, I guess that this is merely a European problem, a European evolution. I'm not aware of a similar evolution in the States, but probably once again, this will become a global problem. And then John Cleland, if we have more open access, could we increase the volume of papers which could drive down cost? Also, how can we support open access from low income countries? And, and this is an important issue with the open access, John, you're right, we create disparities, we create inhomogeneities, not only, not only uh, uh, among countries, but also among others. For instance, if a European author can only publish in open journal, uh, in open journals, fully open journals, while for American authors, this is not needed, this is not necessary. Well, this again generates a discrepancy, a discrimination between European and non-European authors. It's an important issue. And I think this will be really uh, carefully and heavily discussed in the next one, two years. Then a question from Italy, my friend Eugenio Picano, a proposal for the editor-in-chief, a new section of the journal dedicated to environmental cardiology. Well, we don't have a section on environmental cardiology, but we have a section on epidemiology and prevention, but maybe Eugenio, something to think about. Then a uh, question from Samuel Gottlieb. Uh, it became difficult to publish non-COVID studies in the last year as compared to the pre-COVID era. What can be done? Well, this is uh, in general, in general, uh, a problem. Uh, and you can see on the other hand that COVID papers are very well cited and, and downloaded. In the European Air Journal, we have been quite prudent in uh, not exceeding in the numbers of papers published on COVID. This was something we discussed with Tom because this really happened during the transition phase between Tom and me as editor in chief. And for the European Art Journal, the, the, the attitude has been quite, quite conservative. We published two issues only on COVID and probably a third will come up, but we didn't have any inflation of publications related to COVID. Then another question from uh, Danilo Neglia. Uh, thanks for the great work and the interesting news about the journal. Could you briefly comment about the policy used to propose transfer of papers to other journal? Uh, of the journal family. Well, of course, this has been first to be accepted by the others because when the others submit the paper, they have the option to, uh, to, have, uh, to have proposed transfer if the paper is not accepted in the European Art Journal. So if the uh, other accepts potential transfer and the editor in chief of the other journal where we want to transfer the paper, accept the transfer, then the transfer takes place. Uh, otherwise not. Oh, Jay Mehta from, from US, an old friend of mine, uh, glad to be a member of the editorial board. Can we have a copy of the slides presented today? Thanks. Well, uh, the, this, um, Jay, the, uh, this uh, presentation today will be, will be posted in YouTube, so you can find the slide and the presentation there, and we stay there for a long time. Uh, Deepak Bhatt, uh, great job with the journal. Uh, thank you, uh, Deepak. Uh, do we know yet if the impact factor in general will go back to the uh, prior way it was calculated? Uh, well, I don't have this feeling, but uh, I mean, everything can, can happen. I don't have the crystal ball, but uh, I don't think that it will go back because the new way of calculating the impact, the impact factor stems from the need of putting uh, what we publish as soon as possible uh, in, uh, in, uh, in PubMed to have advanced publication. And, uh, and uh, as, we want, as all others prefer to have advanced publication as soon as possible, this to some extent imposes this new way of calculating the impact factor. Then we have the last two questions. Uh, one is from uh, Priyanka. Uh, Dr. Priyanka, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, he says, or oh, she says, good evening. So probably this is from uh, from Australia. Uh, would the impact factor of the oh, from Asia? 
or the impact factor of the journal be affected if the journal gives a room to more open access ideas? Thank you. Now, well, what, uh, what uh, in the calculation of the impact factor, the, uh, what we publish, uh, what we pub if we publish an original paper, uh, this original paper goes into the denominator in the calculation of the impact factor and also in the numerator. Uh, doesn't matter if it is an open, an open paper uh, or, or not, anyway, uh, doesn't, uh, have, doesn't have any influence on the calculation of the impact factor. And then we have another uh, uh, question, comment from Ali, Ali Cavani from uh, OUP, uh, in response to John Cleland's question regarding open access, I'm reading what she's writing, but she's a, she's a very good expert in this. Um, so the, in response to John's question regarding open access opportunities for low-income country, OUP is a developing country initiative that allows others in low-income countries to receive a full, a full waiver on the open access charge. This is available for the for all fully open access journals at OUP. Uh, and this is a very important information. This is an answer only not only to John, uh, to John Cleland, but also to Salim Yusuf, the need of the journal, the, 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 uh, the wish of the journal to be truly global. Uh, Peter Libby, good move OUP. Uh, comment of Peter, uh, one of our executive editors on what just, uh, on what have just read. And then the last question is from uh, Adam Torbicki. Uh, there's relatively little, op little options in EJ journal family for pulmonary circulation. Well, it is obvious that this question comes from, from, from Adam. Uh, for circulation and right heart problems. Uh, it contrasts with usually high interest in guidelines on pulmonary embolism and pulmonary hypertension as evidenced by high citations. Aren't we missing some uh, opportunity? Well, uh, we, are, we are publishing papers uh, on, there are several papers in the pipeline and some perhaps already, if I remember already, already in advanced access um, on, on pulmonary embolism. I agree that uh, this area is a bit underrepresented in the journal, but of course what we publish depends on the manuscripts uh, uh, we uh, we receive and uh, and uh, if we receive good manuscripts on pulmonary hypertension and uh, and uh, uh, heart, right heart failure well of course we take them into serious consideration and this was the last uh, the last question uh, oh no well some more coming one very last question from francesco Brusotta, who is one of our local associate editor again on open access he writes, maybe you want to communicate about the fact that we obtained from Oxford the possibility to have limited open access options when we tweeted. Well, uh, Francesco Brusotta is, uh, is, in, is an editor, uh, is a social media editor. And this is a technical issue. If we tweet uh, about uh, a manuscript, this manuscript should be available at the time of tweeting. So, the, but this is a very technical question, Francesco, it's more for the editorial board discussion than for, than for the large audience we have today. Uh, this is the last question I can read. Uh, Amelia, am I wrong? Or is the last question we have today? Looks like the last question and uh, we are aiming to stay stick within the time, so we might move on. Okay, excellent. So we, uh, and now, and now, last but not least, the annual awards. Well, this is the certificate which will, uh, will be received by the uh, reviewers of the years, 20, the 20 reviewers of the year. Again, this is a virtual meeting, so we cannot give the certificate today, but uh, all, the, uh, all, the, all the reviewers uh, who have been awarded will receive uh, this, uh, this certificate. Uh, or, well, perhaps with a bottle of champagne, depending on the budget of the journal. And what the 20 reviewers of the year, this is the least in alphabetical order. And let me read them because I think that really 
uh, well, you know that reviewers are, are really, are, are really are, are the real core of, of the journal. Without reviews and without reviewers, the scientific journal couldn't produce anything. So they are really fundamental. And we are lucky because our reviewers are really fantastic. These are the 20 top reviewers this year, but we have a large global panel of reviewers who really work very, very efficiently with an incredible dedication. And I wish to thank, I wish to thank them all. These are the 20 reviewers of the year based on the, the selection, the, the award, is, the evaluation is based on the number of reviews. Uh, turnaround time and quality of reviews. I read in alphabetical order uh, Maurizio Acampa, Carolambo Santoniades, Ioan Auer, Giuseppe Biondi Zocai, Giuseppe Boriani, Robert Calif, Antonio Cannata, Edoardo Casiglia, Andreas Deiber, Alan Jaffe, Malte Kelm, Irene Lang, Ulrich Laubs, Rosalinda Madonna, Stefano Masi, Thomas Bunsel not only uh, an author, but also a reviewer, Leonardo Rover, Raul Santos, Jan Malte Sinning, and uh, Stefan Windeker, the, uh, the chairman of the, of the ESC meeting this year. And we have the top reviewer of the award, who is just one, and the top reviewer of the award, few seconds of suspense, is Gregory Lip. Uh, congratulations, Greg, for, for this award. And thank you for your outstanding contribution to the journal, not only as an author, but also uh, as a reviewer. And now we have this new initiative of the European Art Journal, which is the Desmond Julian Award. Uh, today, with uh, Professor Brownwald, we have published this editorial announcing the Desmond Julian Award. Uh, well, why Desmond Julian? I think it's obvious. He's really a giant of cardiology. He created the first CCU, the first coronary care unit in Birmingham in, uh, in uh, 19... Uh, in, uh, uh, was in 1964. He, he, he is the mastermind behind the creation of uh, coronary care units, really a giant in the field of, uh, of uh, cardiology, not only, but he is the founder of the European Air Journal. Desmond Julian not only created care, care, uh, coronary care units, but is also the founder and first editor for 10 years of the European Journal. So this uh, uh, award is dedicated to Desmond Julian. And um, in the editorial you can find uh, today, in uh, published today, uh, advanced publication, of course, we write that uh, this award recognizes one outstanding original paper published in the journal during the previous year. Papers are judged by the editor-in-chief and the executive editors on originality, methodology, presentation, and importance, also utilizing accepted bibliometric indexes. The award commends not only the first author of the paper, but also the team in which he or she is working. The award will be presented each year during the annual meeting of the uh, European Society of Cardiology. Well, again, uh, this year is virtual, so we will send the, uh, this, uh, the Desmond Julian Award certificate to whom? Well, again, a few seconds of suspense, and the winner is Dr. Isia Edwin Sama for this paper he published in the European Art Journal. Well, I like this, I like this smiling face, and of course, he's smiling after receiving the communication that the, he has been, uh, is the winner of this award. But uh, we don't have uh, just the picture. Uh, Dr. Sama is with us. Uh, Amelia, can you open the uh, communication with, uh, with Itzia? Dr. Uh, Sama should be unmuted, Dr. Sama. Is already, uh, yeah. Dr. Sama, can you hear me? There we go. Yeah, okay. very clearly. Well, very first, much. congratulations for this Thanks. first Desmond Julian Award. And uh, well, 
short comment. This is the paper which has been awarded. The title is Circulating Plasma Concentrations of Angiotensin Converting Enzyme 2 in Men and Women with Heart Failure and the Effects of Renin Angiotensin Aldosterone Inhibitors, a very hot topic. Uh, Dr. Sama, can you please briefly comment on this, on this paper? Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, this was a, a, a very interesting uh, topic, how we started, you know, we're busy trying to understand the differences between men and women in heart failure. And then the pandemic, the pandemic showed up and uh, we immediately noticed uh, the ACE2 popping out as a major uh, protein that is highly upregulated in men. And this was also the receptor to which uh, the virus engages before entering the host. So that uh, was quite nice to see. And uh, together with the team, we could really, and your editorial team, of course, and the reviewers, we could really rapidly put this together to uh, give enough information to the rest of the scientific public to work on. And they've done quite a lot, and they also inspired us quite a lot. So I'm quite grateful for this. Thank you. Well, this paper generated a very, uh, very uh, large number of citations and a very high altimetric score. Uh, so was really influential in terms of, uh, of uh, impact and in terms of, of influence in social media. Uh, well, this paper comes from the group of Adrian Wars, who is the uh, corresponding author. Uh, Adrian is with us today. Adrian, can, can you comment on, the, on, on this paper and the orga on the organization of your, of your institution? Yes, thank you so much. And this is really great. And we're very honored with the prize. Um, and this was a very interesting and typical case of serendipity. Um, like uh, Dr. Sama just explained, we were looking for differences between men and women and looking at large amounts of biomarkers in two sizable cohorts of more than 2,000 patients each. And, and what we found was very um, uh, promising that in both cohorts, the top uh, protein that was mostly upregulated uh, uh, in men was the ACE2. And then uh, Dr. Sama brought up his, his knowledge about the SARS-CoV-1 because it was about March 2020 when the pandemic just started. And he uh, remembered that this ACE2 played a specific role in the entrance of the virus into the cells. And that made it suddenly to a very interesting topic. And then we expanded it. And the second intervention was made mainly by Marco Metra, who was at that moment in the middle of the COVID crisis as the first part in Europe, <clears throat> indicating that there was a lot of discussion about whether ACE inhibitors were actually deleterious. And, and there were some assumptions that this was through the ACE2 uh, uh, enzyme. So, both of the aspects made this very uh, interesting also to a large amount of media. And we were approached by really almost the whole world, including Reuters and, and CNN World. And uh, so I, I love this. Uh, I, I like hypothesis generating uh, studies, but serendipity is just great when you experience it. Thank you very much for uh, these uh, uh, explanations and clarifications yeah. and congratulations. Uh, let me make Again. one comment, please. Uh, Professor Brangwald, welcome. Uh, here yeah. we have Professor Brangwald, our global co-editor. Jim, <laughs> please. No, I've enjoyed this meeting. Uh, um, I, it was my privilege uh, to, uh, to uh, know him. And uh, I think that... Um, uh, this is terrific. Uh, Desmond Julian would have loved this paper. So congratulations, uh, Dr. Sama, Dr. Professor Wars. This is a terrific way to get this uh, important uh, medal started in the right way. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gene, for your comments and for your uh, extraordinary contribution to the journal as co-editor and also as owner of the Brownwell's Corner. Thank you for this uh, fantastic publication, which are enriching the journal. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, this brings to the end our editorial board meeting. And uh, well, it's still a difficult moment. We have the, the COVID pandemic, but uh, personally, I am optimistic. Uh, 
science will solve the problems. And I'm also happy with this year as the editor in chief of the European Air Journal because I think that we have fulfilled our mission, which is to, the, which is to give a contribution to the global uh, reduction of the burden of cardiovascular disease. And uh, well, we will meet again in one year. I really hope that next year, the meeting, uh, the European Society uh, Cardiology meeting will not be virtual, but will be vis-a-vis, will be, vis -vis, will be, will be in, pre in presence. We all need to shake hands and to meet each other after this long period. But this experience, this COVID experience, uh, again, is useful and the, uh, the virtual uh, aspect, I think, is interesting. So what I promised, and I'll try to keep my promise, is to have next year uh, a, a meeting in presence vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, altogether, but uh, open uh, with uh, virtually open to all the players of the European Air Journal, which are not just editors, but again, authors and reviewers and, uh, and readers waiting for next year for, let's say, hybrid meeting vis-a-vis uh, -vis in presence and virtual, waiting for the next year. I wish to thank all editors, uh, reviewers, uh, readers, and, uh, uh, and uh, all, of, all of you for the strong support you are giving to the European Art Journal. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye everyone, thank you for joining.